Um, this has been a long postponed <laughs> presentation. <laughs> so I wanna start by thanking Dr. Loreen Termiel Porter for being here um, and for sharing her research and various perspectives with us. Just to introduce her, she currently is an associate professor in family medicine at UB's Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. She is the director of community translational research in family medicine, and also importantly, director of community engagement at UB's Clinical and Translational Science Institute. So multiple hats all focused on the community. In terms of education, um, she is a product of the SUNY system, proudly, uh, a BS in biochemistry from Geneseo, an MS in epidemiology and community health at UB, and a PhD in epidemiology and community health also from UB. And in those days, community health and health behavior did not exist. So yeah. this is as close as we come to CHHB. <laughs> I know, it shows how long I've been here and all the way. <laughs> Okay, in terms of research, she is focused on patients with multiple chronic diseases and has goals that include improving care delivery for these patients, improving self-management and preventative services, and also reducing care disparities that exist in this population. And each of those just by itself is an amazing goal. So you put all three together. Um, it's, it's very important. She serves as a liaison between UB researchers, community partners, um, and in that role, she's part of a network of collaborators throughout Western New York, works with primary care practices to design and implement research, mostly using mixed methods. Um, one highlight or one partnership that I want to highlight is the Patient Voices Network. Um, which is a community-informed um, organization for patients living with chronic conditions. Um, over the years, she's received multiple awards and honors related to her research and community activities. Before I turn it over to Dr. Berhalter, I just want to remind everyone that our next brown bag is on April the 11th, 2023, at 11 a.m. in this room. Jacob Blaisdell, who's over there, will be presenting his dissertation. And I personally have been looking forward to this for a while. So I think it will be well worth um, attending Jacob's presentation. But for now, I wanna turn it over to Dr. Tumil Burkhalter. And you can see the title of her talk, Family History and Breast Health, Learning from the Past to Improve Our Future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I was just saying it's like so much fun to do an in-person talk. I, it's been a long time since I've done that. So um, just seems like everything is so Zoom oriented, but this is great. So um, yeah, so I'm going to focus on one of our more current studies that just actually the funding just ended um, September of 2022. So we're really working on getting all the, the um, analysis done and papers out and next steps kind of organized. So you'll hear about some of the partnerships that we have and how they, um, they played such a huge role in this project. So let me see here. Okay, do I have to click here? Excuse the down arrow. Oh, down arrow? Yep. I don't know if I'm just not seeing. This oh, okay. Just, just this. Oh, this down here. Okay, perfect. Okay. So before I uh, get too much into this, I, I want to acknowledge our funding, which is the New York from the New York State Department of Health, and this was from the Patricia S. Brown um, Breast Cancer Risk Reduction Education Research Grant Program. It's a mouthful. Um, it's, this was a, a funding source that I had just learned about when we applied for this. I had never heard of it before. And it's actually in honor of Patricia S. Brown, who died from metastatic breast cancer um, and really focused on developing um, more strategies to increase screening and better care options for, um, for women and reducing health disparities. So now we actually just submitted to Pat Brown again. Um, and these are 
sort of pilot grants, but the, the rules have changed a little bit. So instead of the academic partner being the lead, a community partner has to be the lead. So we actually just submitted on Tuesday um, with Jericho Road being the lead to do some work in the refugee community on breast cancer, and as well as the African American um, community using imagery as opposed to like you know our traditional flyers and things like that. Really different types of imagery. So fingers crossed on that one. So how did we get here? So there's a little bit of a history here and, and patient voices is a huge part of that. Um, this is a group that I've been working with now for the past 12 years and 12 years ago, if you asked me if they would stick with me, I would have said, I can't see that happening in a million years, but they did. Um, there's some people that are, are from our very first original meeting and then other group people that have kind of come and went over the years. Um, these are people with lots of chronic conditions, um, mostly recruited from practices. Originally, they were, practice, they were recruited from Jericho Road as well as um, Jefferson Family Health, which doesn't exist anymore. It's a G-Bond practice now. It's Urban Family Health. But um, so people change, practices change. So now that's not as um, a connectivity piece as it used to be in terms of the practices. But some of the, our members were at our very first meeting and have been part of lots of things over the last 12 years and other people have joined on as we've had different projects. Um, one of the cool things that I love to see is that people who participated in studies then want to become part of the group because they, they see what their role is. Um, the hardest thing for me with this group um, is losing people since they're all older and have multiple chronic diseases. We have lost several of our members um, and that, that's that been a really tough thing on me and, and on my team um, and the other members of Patient Voices. So that that's something I didn't think about when we first got into this, but 12 years later, um, it's just our reality. So what we started with when Patient Voices first started, we had NIH funding to do some practice-based uh, interventions and it could be on any cancer. So the group actually decided what cancer to choose. And they actually started with colorectal cancer because they didn't want to pick something that was just men or just women and they wanted to be more inclusive. But breast cancer was always um, kind of prominent for the group. And as you can imagine, most of the members are women. Um, so we actually have one man that has been part of our group or we've had men come and go, but our, our staple is 84 years old now and has been part of our group since day one. So he's kind of like the surrogate grandpa to everybody. Um, he's hilarious. But um, so one of, we got a small grant from Coleman and one of the big complaints was there's all this breast cancer education out there, but you know, and there's these walks and there's these promotional things, but you have to pay to do it. And you have to go to an area of town that you're not, that you're not used to. So our community isn't going. And so they said, let's do a walk. So we got this little grant from Coleman. I think it was like, it was no more than $5,000 to put on this walk around kind of where the medical campus is. It was Carleton, North, Jefferson, and um, High Street, I think. So it was free. We had, you know, a tent in at Maston Park and people kind of had a party afterwards. One of our members who has since passed away was a DJ. And so he came and had all the speakers and the amps and the music, and he kind of took care of all the entertainment side of things. Um, but people were, first of all, people were like amazed because, you know, you have to go to the, um, the businesses to let people know that you're going to be on the street and the street's going to be closed down. Well, people are just so happy to see people on the street because it's not kind of the usual thing to just walk up and down Jefferson, you know, and one of the things that I really valued about that experience was learning all the really cool nuances on Jefferson Avenue that you don't see when you just drive down. So we did this walk twice. Of course, we're in Buffalo and we thought it would be great to do in October. And the first year it was so cold that the, um, the, the like you could see it like radiate off the ground. And then next year it was a torrential downpour and like where your pants were like soaked, you know, cause it was like that angled rain. But we still had about 300 people come out. And um, it, so we had a good time anyways. It just was just made the experience, I guess. So with that, that project, we had mobile mammography just started here in Western New York. 
and in Erie County and ECMC Foundation had a mobile unit. And so we had the, the unit at the SWAC and nobody took advantage of it. And we said, well, you know, it's in a park. Maybe people just don't want to be in a park. So we talked to Jefferson and Jericho and we said, you know, what if we did a follow-up at the site, like where the bus is at the site? Well, with that, we had over 70 people get screened and we thought, hmm, maybe we're onto something here, like bringing the, the bus to the practices where people are comfortable. So that we ended up getting larger Coleman money for. Um, and for seven years, we facilitate, well, we're still doing it, but for seven years, we had Coleman funding to do that where we had patient ambassadors. So members of patient voices at the practice because the practices were like, oh my God, you're gonna have 50 women come in here on top of her already chaotic practice, no way. So we had to like divert, you know, the people coming in and um, just work with the bus staff, with cancer services program for coverage, with the sites to set it up however they wanted to. So we've been it, at our highest point, I think we had nine practices and then of course COVID hit and that kind of plummeted. So our main practice right now is still Jericho Road. Um, and we have a little funding that Jericho actually got through HRSA to continue this work. Um, and it's also built into our, uh, our current submission. So our patient ambassadors were interacting with these women every month, every month, every month. And they were hearing people kind of complain about, well, you know, I have, I, why am I not getting screened more? You know, my mom had breast cancer, my sister had breast cancer. Why am I not getting tested? These types of things. And, you know, those are such individualized conversations, but it was not, it was kind of clear that people weren't talking to their providers about this and what some of the options were. So that information led us to do some interviews with breast cancer survivors who are African-American, um, as well as some focus groups with just women who are over 40 and, and identified as African-American. And we learned a lot. And one of the things that we learned the most is that it's not even just about talking to the providers, it's that they don't have their history. They don't, they, it's not something that's commonly discussed. And so um, really kind of starting back a step about where, um, how women can get this information and how important it is. The other thing that was, I thought kind of hilarious is that we, you know, we did our demographic survey of our, our focus groups and we screen that we, you know, if you had, a, if you're a cancer survivor, you're not eligible for this. But people would say, no cancer, no cancer. And then in the focus groups, it came out that they were survivors or currently um, being treated for cancer. And, you know, my team was like, well, what do I do? Like we double checked, we kind of, and we went back to these women and we were like, what's, you know, what's going on? And they're like, well, we just wanted to participate and we didn't want to be kicked out because we had this diagnosis. So they just kind of side skirted that screening element, which was fine. The conversation was just as robust, but it kind of, it, signify that these women wanted to have a voice and wanted to be taught. And of course, our eligibility, our eligibility criteria sometimes deters people from participating, especially from if they're from underrepresented groups. So this led us to Pat Brown and um, really thinking about what can we do and how can we do a better job of educating women about family history and what their options were and are. And how can we say like, all right, how do we talk about this with our families and then share it with our doctors? So um, we had our CBPR team, our community-based participatory research team. Um, as you can imagine, our Patient Voices Network and our patient ambassadors were part of this from day one because this was all leading up to what we were doing. Um, the picture here is Pam, who has, again, been with us since day one. Um, and she has just been an instrumental part of Patient Voices. So we've worked with Pam, um, and then we worked with a group called Our Curls, who um, offered supports for African Americans who were diagnosed with cancer in any kind of cancer, whether it be wigs or makeup or support groups. Um, so they since relocated to their leader, uh, really relocated to Atlanta, and so they just dissolved Our Curls um, in December of this year. So they had a big event. Um, to kind of celebrate what they were able to accomplish. Uh, we worked with Winsong Radiology. Uh, their genetic counselor there was a big part of the team. Not being a geneticist, we wanted to make sure that all the information that we were sharing was accurate and you know, that we were answering questions well and all of that. Um, you know, ECMC Family Medicine, we had a, a provider on our team, um, Dr. Glasgow. 
and UB School of Nursing, Darryl, uh, Dr. Samaji was part of our team as well. So the purpose um, of, our, of our study was to develop an educational curriculum that highlighted the importance of knowing family history and sharing it. Um, one of the things that we were getting in our, our focus groups was that's not my information to share. So even if I know it, who am I to tell anybody that what my mom or my sister or my cousins had? So that was something that we talked a lot about. Um, so this was all participatory. Um, patient voices and our curls were all part of the curriculum development. And then we in invited other people to participate in focus groups to help us flush it out, both not only the content, but also the um, logistics of recruiting and um, how we should work this out. And then we offered it either in a one-on-one -on -one setting, like telephonically, or, or in a group, and either led by um, a peer, so someone from Patient Voices, or, so, uh, or a researcher, so one of my research associates. Um, and then, of course, we shared the results. That was one of the big things. So here's just our timeline. And of course, I won't go through all this, but it was pretty intense. So um, the planning, we had a full year of planning. Um, again, focus groups, we did a lot of uh, patient ambassador training. So we recruited patient ambassadors who would um, operationalize the curriculum and work with the women. And, you know, the outline is a lot of what you would imagine, risk factors, family history, how do you collect it? Um, why should I include in my... Mm -hmm. What were your criteria for selecting the patient ambassadors? They have to have cancer or what? No, nope, they're just from the community oh. and willing, you know, part of most of them... Most of them were from patient voices, although we had a few who participated in the earlier focus groups who wanted to be trained and, and then came. So it was just okay. being from the community um, and just willing to go through all the training and all of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so not exactly a peer model, like, you know, like having somebody like witness where they have, you know, many of their peers have, have had cancer and then walk through. So a little different. Um, so also, you know, thinking about starting the conversations and tools, you know, we had the family tree diagram that they could actually fill out and work through. So our recruitment, we had a um, recruitment flyer that um, patient voices and our curls were very vocal about what that should look like and what it should entail and the language that we should use. And um, we originally started focusing on just zip codes that were that had a high residence of uh, African-American uh, community. And our, so in Erie County, and then some of our patient voices said, well, what are we about Niagara County? Like they need help too. So we ended up including Niagara County as well. Um, one of the things that we did here is we use a lot of different resources to recruit women. Our goal was to recruit two women or 200 women into this study. So four in each of the um, arms. I'm sorry, 50 in each of the four arms. And our biggest uh, uh, strategy for recruitment was the Buffalo Research Registry, which this is sort of a cheap plug, um, is part of the UBCTSI. And they, um, we have about 6,000 people in it now. And about half are either from underrepresented zip codes or self-identify as uh, um, an underrepresented minority. So one of the things that we found, though, is most of our contact initially is through a mail, either email or a mailing, but we really got successful with recruiting when we called them after they received that initial mailing, because a lot of people had questions, and then, and then we were like, okay, now people are really like interested in this. Um, patient voices were handing out flyers like crazy, so some of them were friends and family. Uh, we did put this out on Facebook, but that was a really low percentage of, of recruitment strategy for us. So we ended up with 196 women. So we were pretty excited about that, especially since, you know, everything had to be done virtually now because we were in the throes of COVID when this got funded in two, 2019. And so our main recruitment was in 2020, which was like, e, what are we going to do? But it all worked out. So why women participated? Many of them had a personal connection. That was the biggest thing, or they were really interested in understanding it, or they were referred. Um, but we're really trying to understand a lot about why people participate in research and certainly why they don't. 
So of course we had a baseline survey that that started out as as women were uh, recruited and random, randomized into the four arms. We had a baseline questionnaire, so we can tell you a little bit about who participated. So we had um, sixty five percent of the women identified as African American. So we just recruited geographically, so we didn't exclude anyone who was not um, that did not identify as African American. And this was really intentional because um, a lot of the group is like, everybody needs this help, but you know, not just African-American women. And, and it's also like to put on a screener, you know, if you, you're not a certain race, you can't participate. It's so, so weird. And so we just geographically was, um, it just was a better fit for us. And so we did have quite a bit of participation from diverse race uh, races that living in those communities. So we excluded if they were outside of the zip code, but not outside of anything else. 93% um, were non-Hispanic and 57% were 50 to 64 years. And uh, this is important too. We had um, women who had a high rate of women, about 64%. Well, that doesn't make sense. That must be the number. Yeah, that's the number. 64 women who had four years of college. So our education was pretty equal. So as you can imagine, what you find in other studies is that the people that participate in our study were more likely to be employed and more likely to be higher, have higher education than what the demographics of the zip codes show, which we would expect. And we see that in the Buffalo Re Research Registry too. So that's just kind of reflective of, of um, the nature of research, I guess. And then the little zip code shows you where the majority of the women came from. So even though we included Niagara Falls, we only had four participants from Niagara Falls. So again, these were much more, um, in, women were much more in tune to their health. 97% uh, saw a primary care provider regularly. 96% had at least one mammogram and 90% planned on having a mammogram in the upcoming years. So, so again, this was a group that was more open to screening, had a good experience with screening, but we're still interested in learning more. So we had 23% uh, that currently smoke, which is that, that's about the same rate as the general population still, isn't it? A little high, a little high? okay, but, but not, yeah, yeah, what you would expect. Um, we had, you know, 35% of women who never drank, 31% who had ever used hormone birth control. Um, this, we had a lot of women with a lot of children. So um, the majority of women uh, had two to three children, but we had almost 20% that had six or more children, which I was like, we have, we have a lot of children here that we're talking about. So I, I was like, I wonder what that, you know, how that impacts participation or anything like that. And I, we didn't ask the question, so I don't know, but I, I was kind of surprised by that. Um, so with our family history, we had 45% did have a family history of breast cancer. 21% um, had a family history of breast cancer before the age of 50, which again, since African-American women are more likely to be diagnosed younger with more aggressive tumors, I wasn't super surprised by that, but I thought it was still higher than I would have expected. 17% um, had a history of ovarian cancer, which I thought was very high. And then 2% had a hi family history of male breast cancer. And I'll tell you, in this group, as we were planning, male breast cancer was a real like trigger for them. They were really interested in that and felt that men needed to be as educated as women did, did even though the rates are that low. 2% um, is high. But one of the questions that we had, and of course, we don't have all the data to support that, but we think these women may have been related. So even if they had a, a, if they knew, if they had a man in the family with breast cancer, they may have been related. So it may have been the same man, but we're not sure about that. That's what we think. Um, but there, it, but it was, it was, it came up over and over again in these focus groups and these conversations where we were really surprised by that. So we had only 8% had discussed a genetic test for breast cancer screening and only 5% had ever had a genetic test. Um, in our earlier interviews with cancer survivors, the majority of them had the testing done not at the prevention stage, but at the diagnosis stage. 
And I was like, why is that? Like there's, you know, if there's family history, why aren't women being, especially if they're getting diagnosed, if they're more likely to be diagnosed younger, why aren't they getting tested earlier so that they can start a more aggressive screening regimen? And I, that's, that's a bee in my bonnet. Is genetic testing covered by health insurance? If you have the right um, family history. Like, so generally the, the process is, is you go to a genetic counselor, they do your family tree, they can submit it to the insurance company. So now I don't know if all insurance companies are the same, but there is more coverage for it than certainly, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, so that, that could be part of it, depending on the types of insurance these women have. Um, but it's not even brought up like that. That's the thing. It's just not even addressed. So um, now that being said, the women, even though it was a small sample, the women that were tested weren't positive. And it, um, and it goes back to um, Heather Oaks Balcom's study of are we testing for the right mutations uh, in different you know, groups of women? So, so that's kind of... Um, you know, a question that's out there, is there really a mutation, but we're just not seeing it in what we're testing for. So, you know, most of the women had a working knowledge. Um, the ones that they, so 76% of women, um, th these are pretty knowledgeable women, but still we had 25% uh, that, that didn't know that change in size or shape of the breast are common signs or um, the connection between ovarian cancer. Um, and also we had about 28% that, that answered incorrectly that, um, that family history was a risk factor, major risk factor. So um, we're still looking at um, the follow-up data to see if, if we have changes in that now. But here, you know, my family doesn't talk about breast cancer. We ask people to, to, to agree or disagree. And you could see that almost 50%, a little more than 50%, um, well, a little less than 50%, don't talk about their family history very often with, um, with their families. And we have about, uh, again, about 50% that don't know their family history where the other about 50% do or feel confident that they do. So this one I thought was interesting. And again, it's a little more than 60% would say I would only bring up my family history if my doctor asked me. So, you know, we fill out those forms when we go to the doctor and we check our family history and it kind of, sometimes it gets brought up again, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, and of course it can change. So how often is it updated? And I'm sure every practice is probably a little bit different on it. So then we developed the education. We had one-on-one -on -one phone calls. Um, again, they were, we estimated about five phone calls per, like to get all the curriculum in. One of the things we found is that that was just too many. It needed to be fewer. Um, so they were, so women were assigned to one of the four groups. Um, and then we either had one, a member of the research team. So uh, Lori Johnson is a graduate student who worked with us on this and then a research associate, Jess Leone. Um, they, they did the majority of the phone calls for the research end of things and the group sessions. And then Pam, that Pam again, um, and a few others did all the patient ambassador calls and the group sessions. So again, we learned that the one-on-ones, there were too many of them, only 45 um, percent finished three or more calls. So I think if we stayed at three calls and tried to get in as much as we could, it would have been better. Although there was like a nice relationship that was being developed between the women, um, but 82% completed. And then 64% completed the group uh, education se sessions. So as you know, scheduling is so difficult and it's so easy to sign up for one and then not show up. And so that was kind of, at some point, we just had to call it and be like, you know what, we we just can't offer any more of these. So right now, um, we just finished. So in September, it would have been like in July, we finished our, our third data point. Um, so we're still working on the analysis to be able to do some comparisons. Um, okay, so from our initial feedback, 
since I don't have like end data to share with you yet, we did for those who finished the post the education and then we did that immediate um, feedback. We learned that most of the women are comfortable talking about breast health in either setting. Um, most learn new information, so 87%, and 7% found some of the information confusing. So that was helpful to know when we have a little bit more detail on what things were confusing so that we can address those. Um, the majority of the women thought that it was above average uh, education, really liked it, really liked their facilitators, um, found them to be friendly and prepared, um, and that they were able to explain the content well. So things that they most liked about it, you know, the one-on-one, -on -one, people really like the information, um, the, the relationship building so that they're talking to one person and they had multiple touch points with them. So they really like that. They like the privacy of the, the conversation. Um, so, uh, you know, and it was like we were friends. She made me laugh each time we talked, you know, so, so kind of putting everyone at ease. Um, but then the group sessions, and I think this is what we would expect, even if we're talking about interviews versus focus groups, that, you know, that the group dynamic was really good with the groups, um, that people really liked it. And the logistics, because we did these all on Zoom, it was just easier, you know, if they could show up, they showed up, and then they were over and done with it. So it was like a one, two hour session. Um, so thinking about other people and what, and kind of brainstorming and thinking about things differently. Um, and then just the importance of asking questions of relatives on both sides. So like I said, we just finished not too long ago, the post questionnaire uh, follow-up. So we're finishing those, we're analyzing the data, doing more of the pre and post comparisons. Um, and some of the research questions we'll be answering, as you can imagine, are did the education improve knowledge? Um, did the education increase intent? So since we only had a three month follow up, we had questions about intent for screening because we didn't have a way to actually measure if they did get screened. Um, and it, is one on one or group sessions more effective in, in any of those um, constructs. So that is where we are. And so that's kind of I feel like I was talking really fast. Um, but so we, we have this and now, like I said, we, we have this follow up. The next step is with uh, working with our imagery. Um, refugee and new American population and our African American population and thinking about different ways to um, explain the data. It's pretty complicated. And there's a lot of research out there on um, kind of metaphors, but but like the one of the metaphors they um, came up in a previous study was the idea of like a river and when a river runs over the, the banks, you know, and, and talking about the spread. So not your traditional metaphors that we generally use in um, about cancer. So thinking about how these women, so we're focusing on Somali, Bengali and um, African-American women and what images would really come to mind instead of, uh, again, us coming up with these images and saying that this was a good description. Um, so that's what we're doing. Um, the patient voices group is just, we, we meet every other week as a steering committee um, and then bring them together if we have something else for a larger group. So that's still um, going pretty strong. So, well, yeah. I've never been stung by a bee. I've been stung by a bee, but I'm curious about your bee and bonnet problem. So you're confused with why the genetic counseling screening rate or genetic counseling or genetic testing is low. Right. Right. Well, so more so that the experience, and again, the numbers are small, yeah. but it seems like the literature supports this, that um, in a lot of communities, the genetic counseling is offered at time of diagnosis, yeah. where if you have a significant family history, it could be offered and it'll change your screening rates. Or right. change your screening regimens, I should say. Get you screened earlier, yeah. add in other screening. But then I think there might be two other data points that you presented that might help to disentangle the problem. One was that half of them don't talk about their family history. Right. So if they don't have the awareness of their family history, exactly. and therefore they don't talk to their doctors about their family history, they'll they never be not. suggested right. to go through genetic counseling because the information relay hasn't made it from step one to step four. Yeah. So I guess in some ways that seems like the point of intervention. I, I think it is a point of intervention for sure. And I know like in 
some of the interviews there, there were some women who did talk to their doctors and whenever, so it's kind yeah. of a, yeah. yeah, but I think you're right in this study for sure. It, there's a disconnect yeah. for sure. And it could be, could be really important in the delivery of care. That's what I was with outcomes. Yeah. Similarly with Lorraine's question about insurance coverage, did you at the baseline assessment look at um, insurance coverage? Um, I'm trying to think. I think we asked them if they had insurance. One of the challenges with assessing insurance, and I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here, is it changes so much. And then they might say independent health, but depending on what plan, right. it's really hard to capture if they're like underinsured. Yeah. So that's a challenge. I will say this. So the next thought that I had was mm -hmm. then the number the um, number of kids is actually quite high. And the average, I mean, the women were 30, 50 to 60 more women. Yep. I think if I remember your demographics yep. yep. right. So those would be women who presumably would have some daughters who yeah. are and to get approaching an age where we might want to start thinking about having in conversations with the next generation. So the cycle, the yes. perpetuation of the continues. So and, have you thought about that? Like yeah. the, following then, up with the women's children. Yeah, that following up with the women's children is a really great idea. And um, that came out a lot in the focus groups and why they would want to do that is just to make sure that like, it wasn't about that. It was it was more about their families and keeping their families safe and all that. That that was definitely a driver and a motivator. And you showed that when it said like what motivates you to be in the yeah. big chunk of them indicated family history or just personal connection. So yeah, I couldn't help but think given the number of kids that, that uh, women yeah. reported that that's no that's a, a nice that's kind a of really new cool idea. And so many of these women said you know can I take care so we could we could definitely do some follow up on that. That would be great. Because if they're uh, going backwards in time, if they're not engaging in the conversations with the generation that precedes them, mm -hmm. how does that impact their comfort or willingness with the generation that follows them? Right. And that right. seems to be like a nice consequential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. And I think that's when some of the diagnoses, like that's when it starts happening. Yeah. Um, and and it's, it's really fascinating. And I like, I think about my own family too, on how many times like we sat around and then like, who had what? And my, you know, my mom's grandmother, did they, they had something, but we don't know. And we're always like, we, we have to ask Nancy. She's like the keeper of all those secrets, you know, she knows everything. But um, so, you know, I was thinking about these dynamics just in any family dynamic and, and how we address them to do a better job with some of these things. So, and, and make it more accessible because I think, you know, when you add on, um, you know, again, multiple chronic diseases and and practices that may not have all the services that you want in there, you know, that you're like, how do we do this effectively and not have our sites like kind of freak out because there's all these things going on. Um, but it's it's good. And the, the practices have been so receptive, you know, like Jericho, I can't even say enough about, you know, and I'm preaching to the choir here too. They have so many cool things that they're doing and they're just when we are talking about how to do this, we're like, oh, but what's neat is if we're recruiting just from Jericho for this practice, then we can actually look at screening rates and actual screens and, and how we can do that a little bit better. So I'm, I'm kind of coming off that grant writing high and I, I'm like, like really liking this project. So, yes. So a couple of thoughts. One has to do with family history of refugee and immigrant populations. Because the continuity yeah. that might exist among American, you know, populations that have lived in the U.S. for decades, yep, will not be there. So Absolutely. Have you thought about how that part of the research approach is tackled? So, so the grant that we just submitted is in focused is strongly on family history. Um, it's basically focused on all risk factors and and describing screening in a way that's more comfortable um, with both men and women from different cultures and, you know, and always being cognizant of that dynamic as well. So it's really thinking about um, how to do that. And that, that's why we need our community partners to help tell us. So the new grant has uh, committees, curriculum committees, we're calling them, of each of those three communities to help us think through exactly that. Like, how do we talk about it? Because we, we're not going to know and they're not going to know. So it's just going to be the, the question might actually be, do you know, you know, and, and if so, who, um, I mean, of course we would word it a little bit differently, but when we analyze it, we might have to think about that because, and just the, the access is so different just depending on 
um, you know, what camps they're in, where they're from. It's, it's all so yep. dynamic. So the other thought I have, because I'm a behaviorist, mm -hmm. is the issue around intent versus behavior. Yes. And many of us do what you do, which is collect intent data because of the strength of the and so forth. Any thought to including as a component, um, literally setting up an appointment at the end of the oh. It's a so nice idea. Not, well, I'll get to it whenever. Yeah, yep. But we have an opportunity at Winsong or whatever um, during the next month. We'd like to set up an appointment yeah. if you're interested. You know, kind of. That's a nice idea. And I. Because. Yeah. Life can get. It um, gets right. No, that's a great idea. And I think with. Um, you know, with the new grant that we just submitted, with with it being kind of focused, we are we have they have workflows. Jericho already has workflows that are in place that we can tap into very easily. Right. Um, and you know, they have this really nice mammogram template page that keeps track of a lot of stuff. So, um, so I think that's a really great addition. And then, and like I said, now that we, you know, if we're working specific with specific sites, then we can actually track out and see what if women actually do get screened because again setting up the appointment doesn't necessarily mean that they go to completion but, but we can yeah behavior. so i think we could do that and you know especially with the longer grants it, it helps to be able to do that because that that was one of our, our follow-up was just so short yeah. and this particular study we didn't have all the dynamics with all the different because they were practices all over the place so we didn't have the bandwidth to to do that, but the new one we do, if we get it, hopefully we'll get it. But that's a great idea and in, in integrating it right in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, the the other thing I have to say, like, you know, I've worked with both Winsong and with like Western New, New York Breast Health. And I always tell them I'm Switzerland, you know, we, we can't, where it's the woman's choice where she wants to go and get screened. Um, but it's the ECMC bus that has a relationship right now with, with Jericho Road. And during COVID, um, we were still reaching out to women to schedule them because that's one of the things that the patient ambassadors do. And they're like, we don't want to go to a freestanding place. We'll wait till the bus is back. And so they, that relationship building is so important. It's, it's amazing. And we were like, okay. So, you know, we're like, when are you coming back? When, you know, because that was you know, screening mammography started, but the bus was still, and the practices were cautious. They didn't want extra people and all of that, but, but now they're kind of back in a groove, but women were like, I'll wait. And I'm like, I don't know if this is good or bad. Like, it's great that they have this relationship, but we don't want people waiting and not being screened, but it was a push and pull a bit. So, um, the school of public health and professionals recently got funded to have a bus and it won't be focusing on cancer, but it will include probably some screening and visits and so forth. Cool. And I'm going to mention you as a person with insights about how people connect with that. And, and the idea, just similar to what you have been doing, is to bring the bus to a kind of central location where people are comfortable. Yeah. I mean, the dental school has a bus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the that they use. Yeah. Yeah, they have a lot. I know they, yeah, yeah they've been at Jericho um, as well. And I know they do a lot in the Southern Tier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that, that mobile approach yeah. is so important because it gets you to the people rather than expecting the people to come to you. Yeah. And it's, you know, I know like in this case, you know, I think with the primary care practices, they were kind of surprised, I think, that it, it worked so well. But doing it once, spotty, didn't do it. Like the, it took a little bit of like every month they're here, every month they're here. And then all of a sudden, like they were like, OK. So when we started out, Jericho had one day and quickly, like after three or four months, they're like, we need another day. But but it took that at all the practices, it's like, okay, it's starting out slow. It's starting out slow, but you got to give it time because then once that comfort level was there, 
Um, and so it was that it was a consistency was a big factor in, in its success. And Winsong has a bus as well. So, um, and now, so there's a little bit of differences. The ECMC bus is older. It has 2D mammography and it has two screenings. So it, could, it can screen up to 50 women a day. Um, the Winsong bus only has one, but it's a 3D mammography. So if you look at them, one is short and flat and the other one's a little taller and it's to accommodate the equipment. Um, so they're both, um, they're both present in a lot of communities. They go to faith base. They go to sites. They they're kind of everywhere. Um, they both have a part of their mission to reach the, the rural communities as well. So I think they're um, they're great. And you know, even with that one, when Winsong's um, bus got funded through the New York State Initiative that increased mobile mammography throughout um, Western New York, well, or all New York State we were like, okay, now there's two buses, now they're competitors, now what are we going to do? And we just said, like, if we're working with a practice and they want Winsong, we're going to go to Winsong. If, you know, if they like ECMC, then we'll stick with ECMC. Like, we, and we are just pretty, very explicit about that. The other point, though, is that even with the EMRs and all this, the tracking of the market, sucks. It's still not, like, it's not good. Like, the tracking of preventive services are not as I, it's just not ideal. Um, we had another study that we worked with uh, um, Upstate and U of R and all of the practices, like we were requesting, you know, baselines and follow-ups at the end of the year. And you would get these like denominators that were all over the place and you'd have like changes in, in staff and IT people and and some like change their EMRs and you're like, oh my gosh, like how are people are even tracking? So even that, it seems like it should be so easy, but it's, it's a real challenge. Um, and, you know, things just don't get updated as often. Like that's why I love the screening form, the mammography screening form, because that way it's, it's a great way to communicate within the practice of where things, where things are. Um, but I, I was floored at how difficult it is still to track your preventive screening rates consistently over time. So, and that was lots of, that was 15 sites across the three communities and every single site had issues. We were like, oh my, this is challenging. So are there any other questions or comments? Again, I wanna thank Maureen, our names often. Yes. <laughs> so. Yep. Um, for sharing this study, and at least for me, giving some insights into the challenges of working in the community. Um, and I wanna commend you for patient voices and all the work you've done over the years to keep a group like that together because they definitely enhance yeah. the research sure. that, that we can do. They're amazing. I mean, some of the changes that they made in the curriculum, but even in the, like the recruitment flyers are like, oh my God, that language is terrible. Like, and you know, and I think I kind of put that hat on about what the community would respond to. And they're still like, oh, you know, like we, we need to th think about that a little bit more. I'm like, okay. So, yeah, no, we need that. Yeah. We need that feedback because ultimately we're doing the research to help right. those communities. And if we don't kind of share their input from day one, then who knows if the results will even resonate with the populations that we want to serve. So, so great. Well, thank you very much. This thank is you. being recorded. And so if there are groups that you want to okay. share it with, that great. would be great. And next time, Jake's on <laughs> um, for presenting his dissertation, April 11th. This room, 11 a.m. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank really you. Appreciate it. So I don't want to. Should I just stop sharing that? I don't want to. You can. You can stop sharing, and you can close this. Room. Okay. Yeah. And, and we can start again. Yeah. Okay.